Thanks, Joe, and, and everyone at the Nicholson Center who participated in bringing Karuna Montana uh, here to deliver this year's Alice in Winter lecture. It's really a privilege to welcome Professor Montana back to the University of Chicago. She is a professor of political science at Columbia University. Before Columbia, she was associate professor of political science at Yale, where she taught for 14 years after teaching at Cornell and receiving her PhD from Harvard. It seems like everyone wants some of her time, which she gives tirelessly to scholars and students all over the world. At every stage, in disciplines beyond political science and South Asian studies, she is beloved by her students for her mentorship. I know because they tell me and I've seen it. And she's sought after by colleagues for the shrewdness, diplomacy, and energy with which she has served and continues to serve her institutions and the discipline of political science. I know this too because I've seen it especially across schools, how across schools of thought, political theory, not just as a field, but as a community, um, it has been enlarged and enlivened by her unstinting efforts to run and host nearly every year for the last 12 years, or it's now it's been by, by every year, the International Conference for the Study of Political Thought an international interdisciplinary organization of scholars and as they put it, informed citizens interested in preserving and encouraging a broad humanistic style of thinking about politics. She is an inclusive and intellectually curious force, as we will see this afternoon. Her erudition and commitment to centering the architectures of power in her interpretations of imperial ideology, past texts, and political practice which includes practices of resistance and democracy uh, in a post-colonial context in particular, and her engagement with the intellectual history and politics of India is one reason that on Tuesday she received the Infosys Prize, an annual award based in India that for the last 15 years has recognized the achievements of scientists, researchers, engineers, and social scientists of Indian origin. This year, the prize in the social sciences went to Karina Montana for what the panel called, quote, her groundbreaking research on the theory of imperial rule and the claim that this late imperial ideology became one of the important factors in the emergence of modern social theory. Here they were referring to the argument of her 2010 book, Alibis of Empire, and remain in the ends of liberal imperialism. The Indian Mutiny of 1857, which as she puts it there, signaled the beginning of a particularly turbulent and violent decade of uprisings in Britain's colonies and dependencies, Ireland, Jamaica, and India, provoked a profound shift in the logic of and rationale for British imperialism. As she writes, the era of the empire's greatest geographic expansion in Asia and Africa actually coincided with a phase of liberal retrenchment and the repudiation of the central assumptions and imperatives underlying the British so-called civilizing mission. In direct response to the dramatic forms of rebellion, resistance, and instability in the colonies, late imperial thinking questioned both the practicality and the theoretical underpinnings of the existing interventionist agenda and substituted the, quote, universalist project of civilization with a new emphasis on deep-seated cultural differences between peoples. What Etienne Balibar would call a tactical mutation, in this case a shift from a universalist to a culturalist uh, stance in 19th century imperial ideology, trained new attention on quote-unquote native society through new forms of racialization or categorization in some contexts, in the specific case of India, the rejection of the civilizing mission of imperial rule provoked Henry Maine and others to reinterpret the relationship between Britain and India in the dichotomous terms of modern and traditional. To make this case, political thinkers like Henry Maine relied on and in turn reinforced developing modern social theory. This provided a language of traditional and modern societies or culture and society that proved useful for imagining and justifying distinct strategies of rule. When Professor Montana's Alibis of Empire demonstrates that liberalism and imperialism stand in a dynamic, live relationship to each other, it is illustrating what has become a guiding concern of her work. 
how to construe the relationship of political thought to its history, which is always a history and interpretation of political action. Over and over, she returns us to political experience, to make surprising meaning out of texts, movements, and figures we thought we knew. More recently, in a series of articles on political action, realism, and nonviolence, both its practice and theorization, we see this sensitivity to dynamism, to the question of how tactics, whether of ideology or protest, shift as the goals of a political project shift. In her new work on Gandhi, which we will hear a part of this afternoon, as in Alibis of Empire, against the grain readings of central political concepts become both generative of and generated by against the grain readings of political action. This back and forth is essential in Montanez's telling for undermining the historical <coughs> distinctions that stand in the way of our ability to see how on the ground political transformation works. So why, for example, in 1919 was Gandhi so quick to follow what looked to be a cascading revolution toward independence? His first attempts at nationwide political mobilization against British rule, as Professor Montana writes in a recent article, were understood to be experiments in mass satyagraha with the aim of achieving Indian self-rule. So this kind of scaling up of dissent through large-scale withdrawal and non-participation, a form of non-violence, had a distinct populist character. And Gandhi appeared, as she says, on the Indian political scene as the champion of direct popular mass action in a manner that was meant to challenge imperial authority as well as disrupt uh, existing patterns of elite politics. But almost immediately, these experiments became imbricated with violence, and Gandhi announced the immediate cessation of mass civil disobedience. The ex extraordinary moment in the history of popular politics, a leader calling off a movement at the height of its political momentum, remains, as she puts it, one of the most confounding of a long and contentious political career. So critics have long seen in this episode evidence of Gandhi's denigration of popular agency, what Professor Montanato calls the betrayal of mass politics as such. This may be a poor element of left critique of Gandhian politics, but according to her, it misses something more complex and seemingly paradoxical. The episode spurred Gandhi to rethink the limits and possibilities of mass satyagraha, quote, not to reject mass action, but forms of action premised on the generation and display of collective power. So why does this matter? Rather than fitting Satyagraha and Gandhi's political response or his activity into familiar models of collective action, Professor Rantino's work on Gandhi shows its originality and its distinctiveness. This is a model of collective action, as she puts it, quote, disturbed by and suspicious of its collective or corporate nature. What are we to make of this? When mass democracy in the form of satyagraha functions as a pure demonstration of power, it is less a form of freedom and more a form of domination and mastery. Here, as in her soon to be revised, soon to be published both Gandhi and the Politics of Nonviolence, Karina Mantana intervenes in a long-standing dispute about whether we should read Gandhi as a philosopher or a political actor. She rejects a system of binarisms that still governs Gandhi's reception. She resists the sentiment of how he thought that portrayed his political success in personal or psychological terms. For a reason, this approach converges with the first to reinforce the divide between a thinker and an actor. The problem is that political theory is not the mere application of moral truths to politics. As she argues, his thinking about politics, even his general truths about politics, emerge in and through political activity. In Karina Montana's hands, problems of interpretation force us to rethink the traditional dualisms of theory and praxis, ideology and reality, to examine, to re-examine their interactions as sites of struggle. Her Alison Winter lecture this afternoon has a title, Gandhi and Victorian Radicalism, that reflects this premise and the dynamic interplay of ideas and context that has become the signature of her teaching and her writing. Please welcome her in the
Thank you so much, um, especially to Dimi Kasimis for that extraordinary introduction. Um, Dimi's been a friend and a cherished interlocutor, and now I have to live up to that wonderful <laughs> set of comments, and who, from whom I've learned a lot about how to think uh, political theory in terms of paradoxes, the paradoxes of democracy, paradoxes of agency, things that we can't solve because they recur. Um, and I'll come back to that point. I also would love just to take a moment to thank Joe McDonough for this wonderful invitation uh, to give this lecture, Jean Fitzsimmons of the Nicholson Center for her amazing organizing of this visit. It's a privilege to speak in this series, honoring Alison Winter, um, whose work I have admired. I, I did not know Alison. I'm not a historian of science, but there is, I think, a small overlap in her first book the, and, the, and, the, and some of the themes that I'll touch upon and the unusual experimentalism of Victorian science of that period. And just, it's been wonderful to see so many friendly faces. Um, okay, so the topic of my talk today is Gandhi and late Victorian radicalism. And what I want to do is try to think about how to understand and assess the influence of that formative intellectual milieu on Gandhi's political thought, and specifically on the theory and practice of Satyagraha. So to highlight the influence of Victorian radicalism, even to talk more specifically of, say, Tolstoy or Thoreau and the impact of them on Gandhi and Satyagraha is to enter into some controversy. I think it's a symptom of how fraught questions of origins and influence are in relation to Gandhi that there is uh, an almost total absence of something like a conventional intellectual biography of Gandhi. Despite the vast library books of Gandhi, which are dominated with the genre of biography itself. Uh, most biographies and histories, they certainly have their obligatory references to Tolstoy's correspondence with Gandhi, Gandhi's didactic translations of Thoreau, of Ruskin, but there is very little, I would say, except for some wonderful stellar articles on what the precise connection might be or influence between Tolstoy, Thoreau, Ruskin, and how it, their ideas on shaping Satyagraha. Part of the reluctance to follow the path of traditional intellectual lineages or influence, I think, is that there is an overwhelming emphasis on popular and scholarly work on Gandhi on his personality, his uh, charisma, his leadership, his character. Nehru, I think, probably cemented it, a key idea when he said, when we think of Gandhi, it's more than his ideas, what matters is what he called the force of his personality. And I think there is, in that, there is also some concern that Gandhi's originality is deflated or cheapened or lost by trying to cite a connection to Tolstoy and Thoreau. Hence, Albert Einstein's almost instinctive response when he was asked, um, he was asked when a, the Thoreau Journal asked if he could comment on Thoreau's influence on Gandhi. And uh, Einstein's quip was, quote, Gandhi would have been Gandhi even without Thoreau and Tolstoy. <laughs> Um, I think there is something um, troubling in that assessment, but I also think it gets at something true. There is something difficult in the traditional models of influence paradigm to capture something of what we might take to be Gandhi's originality. That's using Dennis Dalton's phrase. I think some of these uh, appear in other connected dilemmas. So for one, there's a kind of consistent worry about how to weigh the Western versus Indian provenance of Gandhi's ideas. For example, in this formative period, I'll talk about in London and South Africa, the first 20 years of Gandhi's intellectual political life. In his writings in South Africa, for example, Gandhi rarely discusses Hindu ideas in much depth. He does not engage with Hindu thinkers by name. There's many reasons for that. So it, on its own, it, does this mean that Hinduism as such exerted no influence on his understanding of Satyagraha? Probably not, but hard to trace. On the flip side, Gandhi more than once spoke of Tolstoy, Thoreau, Ruskin as his great teachers. Um, but as uh, scholars like Basham would say, is this a declaration of genuine influence or Gandhi's way of, quote, confirming and systematizing attitudes and values which he had obtained elsewhere? So I think there is, um, but I think there is something, a genuine problem of how to capture Gandhi's Gandhi as a thinker, and I think it's also because, coming back to some of the things that Dimi mentioned, how to capture the nature of conceptual innovation in a thinker who is an activist and a politician that has a particular complicated question of the relationship between thought and action. 
I want to say just two things to frame the talk, and I'll try to give some examples. So I think one is that the way Gandhi read um, was absorptive, accumulative, appropriative. So he's an autodidact, an autodidact and proselytizer. So he tends to use arguments and he'll, do, and he'll incorporate many of them rather than systematically distinguishing himself from, from predecessors, we'll say. And I think secondly, the point that is more central um, <clears throat> is as, sorry, I have to figure out what's making the bumping noises. Um, that he, the way he theorized was in and through action. And Gandhi uh, often innovated in action, um, action that even preceded, <clears throat> so action would, in, innovation would precede conceptual naming and theoretical elaboration. The classic case of this was the invention of Satyagraha itself, which I'll return to. Um, and I'll tr the example I'll try to use is how to think of the formative influence of late Victorian radicalism and show how, it, how we can see its effect on patterns of reading and thinking through a couple of examples. So the first, I'll just give a very brief, um, a little bit of just uh, what, late, what I mean by late Victorian radicalism and Gandhi's insertion. So London, uh, Gandhi came to London in, as a student, uh, three formative years, and he returns to it, 1888. And it was certainly the scene of Gandhi's intellectual awakening. His unusual path to politics began with a vow he made to his mother to maintain a strict vegetarian diet in London. The search for vegetarian food led him to the London Vegetarian Society and through them to the world of late Victorian radicalism. This was a counterculture comprised of animal rights proponents and anti-vivisectionists, labor activists and penal reformers, non-conformist Christians, atheists and spiritualists, and eventually suffragettes and war resistors. These various moral critics and social reformers also affiliated with and embraced a variety of radical political doctrines uh, and movements, anarchism, socialism, anti-imperialism, and pacifism. Uh, and I would say one of the main themes that connected and animated these various groups and ideals was a shared concern with the depredations of modern industrial civilization. Two books that I've learned um, the most from and really engaged this question of Gandhi's relationship to um, late Victorian radicalism is, of course, Leela Gandhi's beautiful affective communities, anti-colonial thought, fin de siècle radicalism, and the politics of friendship, and James Hunt's biography, or biographical writing, Gandhi in London, from, an er from 1993. Um, so, so Gandhi's um, entry into politics, in a way, and his entry into political activity really began with reading Henry Salt's uh, a Plea for Vegetarianism, which was published in 1886, and he says it converted him. He immediately became a publicist and a proselytizer for the cause. He joined the Vegetarian Society's Executive Council, and in fact, Gandhi's first articles he, uh, he ever wrote were in the weekly journal, The Vegetarian. And he would continue to pursue these activities as publicist and proselytizer when he moved to South Africa in 1893. His enthusiasm for vegetarianism took the form of experimentation in dietetics, practices of self-improvement and self-mastery. The link between diet and character is one of the ways in which vegetarianism became implicated in moral and political questions. Salt's moral political arguments against meat eating included the idea that flesh eating impeded the realization of moral life because in his mind, it, in, according to him, it was ethically and aesthetically degrading. It worked against, quote, all the higher instincts of the human mind by overstimulating the lower brutal passions. It encouraged vice and violence. His lifelong, one example was his lifelong campaign against animal cru cruelty and blood sports. And he thought cruelty toward animals eroded our moral imagination and sentiments of sympathy with other human beings. Blood sort, he argued, resulted in the habituation to brutality against the weak and a taste for domination. Perhaps the most directly political argument of vegetarianism lay in the critique of the industrial division of labor as decadent, unequal, and degrading. The poor were forced to perform noxious labor, large-scale animal slaughter, to support the luxury of others. 
Again, this is a quote from Salt, quote, it is the simple truth that our ordinary average well-to-do Englishman, though no individ through no individual fault or special hard-heartedness of their own, but through the callous indifferentism of the society of which they are a product and a part, are in general measure fed, clothed, sheltered, and amused by a long continued series of human and animal suffering. Tolstoy elaborated, a Tolstoy elaborated a commensurate claim in a famous introduction to Howard Williams, The Ethics of Diet, a book Gandhi, part of this world that Gandhi admired. Uh, Ga uh, this, uh, the, it, the, he wrote a famous introduction, then it was published separately as a pamphlet called The First Step. Uh, there, Tolstoy argued, quote, it should, it should surely be clear to everyone that a man who uses for his own pleasure, which he might easily forego, the labor, often the painful labor of others, behaves badly. And, this, and that this is the first, very first wrong action he must cease to commit if he wishes to live a good life. Here again, the habituation to luxury mirrors the habituation to the pleasures of power. Abstaining from meat was a corrective to these ills, while at the same time orienting one towards self-command. Therefore, especially in a society in which multiplying desires continually work to enslave us, vegetarianism, according to Tolstoy, was the first step to a moral life. Salt uh, sought to make vegetarianism uh, and the protection of animals part of a broader project of social reform. In 1891, with the support of other prominent socialist vegetarians like Edward Carpenter, Salt founded the Humanitarian League. They both were also founders of the Fabian Society. Uh, Salt and Carpenter associated the social question, the question of inequality between the classes with oppression and hierarchy between genders, races, and species. Both diagnosed these relations of domination as afflictions of civilization, uh, a civilization that celebrates acquisition and competition, encouraged acts of cruelty and exploitation, bred hypermasculinity, and a will to mastery <clears throat> that confirmed the power of the strong over those deemed weak, outcast, or primitive. <clears throat> this is a little summary <laughs> of the politics of vegetarianism, which is too often seen as a set of tastes or personal tastes. At this juncture, in 1888 through 1891, Gandhi, I think, uh, didn't fully absorb or accept all of these wider political and philosophical ideas and implications. But uh, as I'll try to show, they provided the wellspring for his evolving moral and political views. He would return to them. <clears throat> in South Africa and on subsequent trips to London, Gandhi would become ever more immersed in these dissenting circles. Works such as Carpenter's Civilization is Causing Cure and many others would directly shape the arguments of Hind Swaraj, written in 1909. And then you, uh, more interestingly, I think to me, if you see his long career, you see that concerns about the injustice and immorality of the division of labor motivated Gandhi's first cooperative living experiments in South Africa. Uh, but they became even more central in his maturer political work in his later socio-economic campaigns in India associated with the constructive program. So I think in a general sense, you see Victorian radicalism here seeding ideas and projects that would develop and unfold over time in a kind of recursive manner. And I'll say a little bit more about how that happens. But beyond the substantive connections, I think there is a really important formal feature of this kind of moral radicalism that Gandhi adopts and adapts. And this is namely this very strong belief in the necessary imbrication of self-improvement and social reform, or that politics is an important site of radical ethical experimentation. So uh, to socialists that argued for the priority of structural change through legislation over moral awakening or perfecting personal tastes and habits, Salt insisted that it was not an either or question, quote, reform and self-reform, not reform or self-reform. That is the true key to the solution of the social question. Changing laws that regulate wealth and work inequality were essential, but cultivating practices of frugality and restraint were for Salt a necessary corollary of social regeneration. Self-development and experimentation could not wait for legislation and could pave the way for it. I think this is a very similar spirit of experiment which would pervade Gandhi in politics. And there are an interesting mix here, of course, of a, of a Hindu idea of prayog or the experiments of the self with this idea of moral 
experimentation. I think it's a significant and really more subterranean linkage between his early ideas all the way that tracks to his mature politics. Gandhism would become ever more committed to the moral and political necessity of demonstrating, investigating, enacting ideals in and through daily activity. Like Salt, but perhaps even more insistently, Gandhi argued that social and political reform, the example of, say, caste reform, could not be driven by legislation. Rather, to be lasting, it had to be tied to a fundamental change in habits and practices. It had to be built upon the transformation of the self. Moreover, continuous practical experimentation were also the means for what Gandhi would term the science of Satyagraha. Like the Victorian moralists, Satyagraha presumes a definite connection between the self and the social, between ethical practice, aesthetic practices of the self, the work on character, and effective political action. Now, I want to work through the thought that Victorian ideas provided a kind of continuous wellspring to which Gandhi would return time and again as his ideas and politics developed and matured. Uh, but here I would say to think of the ideas as a wellspring is not to think of them as the engine or the spark of innovation. Rather, I think what you see in Gandhi is that innovation and experimentation were sparked by politics, by, by political uh, questions, political moments. So Gandhi would be confronted by a political impasse, criticism, or acute crises. And in these moments, Gandhi would innovate practically. A new tactic or strategy would take shape. I'll give some examples in a minute. And then he would give these, these new practices theoretical elaboration. And in order to do that, he would return to some of these basic bedrock conceptions. This, I think, I'll, I have no name for it yet, but something like a recursive reading, I think, is illustrated. I'll try to illustrate it brief. Well, I say briefly. This is the course. <laughs> I'll try to be as brief as possible in Gandhi's relationship to Tolstoy and to see what he uses and adapts from Tolstoy. So the most direct and obvious substantive influence of Tolstoy, and maybe we would say broadly the Victorian critics of industrial modernity, can be seen in Hindsraj and has been recognized there. Hindsraj, of course, is Gandhi's most well-known political tract. Uh, it contains his famous critique of civilization. And the appendix of Hindsraj begins with six of Tolstoy's works. It also mentions Carpenter, works by Carpenter, Ruskin, Thoreau, Emerson, and also other lesser, now lesser known, specific critics of Victorian industrialism. So Matthew Sherard's White Slaves of England and other popular texts of the time. Uh, but what I want to focus on more than Hinsraj and the critique of civilization is on, Tolst on Tolstoy, what in Tolstoyan non-resistance, uh, on Tolstoy's theory of non-resistance and how Gandhi innovates from it as he constructs the theory and practice of Satyagraha. And I'll focus on two key moments of innovation or conceptualization before and after Hinsraj. So one is the invention of Satyagraha uh, in 1906 in the campaign in the Transvaal. And the second, I'll come back to the theory and practice of non-cooperation in the early 1920s. I think it's hard to overstate how central Tolstoy was to these dissenting circles of late Victorian radicalism. I think in many ways, I would say he sort of, he became their prophet and galvanizing spirit. And by the turn of the century, many of the moral and spiritual circles that Gandhi happened upon in the late 1880s would develop into full-blown affiliates of a global Tolstoyan movement. And Chicago, of course, Hull House was connected in its own way. Gandhi himself was the center of such a circle in Johannesburg in the early 1900s. Tol of course, it was Tolstoy, the radical social critic of his late years, not the novelist exactly, who attracted this far-flung and global following. From the late 1870s, Tolstoy had begun to champion a new form of Christian morality, one that was rational, introspective, and practical. He rejected traditional church, church doctrines as superstition and church institutions as handmaidens of state domination. Instead, he sought to recover a core Christian ethical truth, what he called the law of love. Uh, and what made Tolstoy's religious writing so provocative, he was excommunicated around that time by the Russian church, was um, how he anchored the religious writings in a searing indictment of modern society and the institutions of the modern state as purveyors of violence, domination, and slavery. The book of Tolstoy's that most captivated Gandhi 
was The Kingdom of God is Within You, which was uh, published in 1894. Gandhi returned to Kingdom of God throughout his life, making it required reading in various study circles, schools, and ashrams he organized. Thematically, The Kingdom of God was a meditation, a caustic meditation on what Tolstoy saw as the glaring contradictions between modern states founded upon violence and the basic tenets of Christian morality. The prime example of such inconsistency was the question of war, of fighting and preparing for war and the obligations of military service and the policy of mass conscription. That states found it necessary and legitimate to coerce their subjects to, to participate in warfare revealed both the deepest degradations of modern politics and a clue to their undoing. Resisting these forces required sincere efforts at living a life consistent with Christian truth. This meant, we saw before, cultivating self-command, conscience in practical terms, the moral life entailed vegetarianism, celibacy, self-sufficiency and labor, and in addition to abstinence and simplification, it also required Moral integrity also required non-resistance to and withdrawal from an immoral and violent state order. Non-resistance, as Tolstoy understood it, uh, was the refusal to resist evil by force. Tolstoy advocated mass practices of non-participation in the form of non-payment of taxes, taxes, and especially the refusal of military service. Uh, withdrawing obedience and complicity which is the sort of core moral idea of non-resistance, was again, we might say the first, now maybe second step, Tolstoy liked to use first steps, <laughs> in moral regeneration, in recovering and cultivating the experience of inner freedom. These features, I think, made Kingdom of God um, singular and important um, as, the, as the first sort of modern statement and defense of pacifism. And it directly inspired in its own time and since the politics of conscientious objection and war resistance on a global scale. The Tolstoyan influence for Gandhi, I think, was most directly at firstly felt, you f first see that influence in the moral, moral and spiritual vocabulary Gandhi was developing uh, to describe nascent practices of satyagraha he began to invent in South Africa. Satyagraha, satyagraha in Gandhi's own telling uh, was he presented it first as a species of Tolstoyan non-resistance. The precise moment of Satyagraha's invention is very clear in Gandhi's mind. It was September 11th, 1906 in the Empire Theater in Johannesburg where 3,000 Indians resident in the Transvaal vowed to resist a new alien registration regime clearly meant to disempower and harass them and stem future immigration. Gandhi introduced the motion about refusing to register at the risk of punishment, but his co-organizers began emphasizing the religious nature of taking a vow to resist. Gandhi says uh, he experienced, this is the moment he experienced a kind of epiphany and a novel political method was materializing. I think what he meant by an epiphany was that in this moment, two branches of his public life collided together. So since his arrival in South Africa in 1893, Gandhi had been le a leading activist or became, styled himself as a leading activist for Indian rights, and he used all the skills of a good liberal activist. Mass petitions, meeting with influential politicians, trying to get them all the way up to, from South Africa and also in London. And so on one side of his public life was a burgeoning politician and community leader. The other side was this growing confidence as a moral and spiritual reformer. The move to Johannesburg in 1902 allowed Gandhi to rekindle close contact with vegetarian and theosophical circles. He would eventually become the central node, as I suggest, of his own Tolstoyan circle alongside Henry Pollock and Hermann Kallenbach, two of his closest friends and collaborators in South Africa. And I think even more than in London, when he was a student, these were years of intense spiritual study and experimentation. The quickened pace of learning in politics and ethics was reflected in a steady stream of writing in the newly found journal, Indian Opinion. So in this moment in, in um, Empire Theater, Gandhi's political activism and spiritual con pursuits converged. And what you see afterwards is a real cascade of novel ideas, arguments, and action. For a period of three years, you have this intense writing throughout Indian opinion, the translations of the Apology, translations of Thoreau, translations of Tolstoy, uh, and the invention of the term Satyagraha, which follows. Now, as I said, one of these 
One of the ways you can see this early framing of Satyagraha as a variation of Tolstoyan non-resistance is that in this initial formulation, Gandhi spent a lot of time justifying it as a refusal to submit to unjust law as part of a divine duty. So there is a kind of religious language, an ecumenical religious language that has a very clear Tolstoyan feel. But I want to point out here that though there is a, a real um, overlap in justification, the actual practical form of sat that Satyagraha takes in this initial iteration is not very Tolstoyan, and Gandhi is aware of this. So the practical in improvisation of Satyagraha in its initial form was the tactic of collective jail going. That's what Gandhi called it. And he recognized that it was different from Tolstoyan non-resistance, and that was in part because it was not passive and it was not withdrawal. Um, and and it, I think this is part of the reason that he required the invention of a new vocabulary and the terminology of Satyagraha. First, from the start, Gandhi recognized and thought what was very novel about Satyagraha was that it was uh, enacted in a more coordinated, organized, and collective manner. Tolstoy had also favored large-scale acts of withdrawal from the state, especially against compulsory military service, but these acts were meant to be uncoordinated. In Kingdom of God, Tolstoy argued that dispersed actions of disconnected individuals, individuals who without communication or collusion refused to serve the government on Christian grounds, would be more subversive than well-worn plots and bombs. Um, so Gandhi was aware that he was charting new ground, and he, he also suggested that, and, he, and the way he said it is that in the, trans, quote, the Transvaal struggle was the first attempt at applying the principle of Satyagraha to masses or bodies of men. So, so in this interesting way, a kind of long-standing, I think, devotion to Tolstoyan ideas inspired Satyagraha, but it almost immediately took on a different form. And here I'll just do a very interest in a small contrast with Thoreau. Um, I think it's interesting because Thoreau represents another kind of practice of reading. So unlike, I think in some ways, Tolstoy was a, an influence, a genuine influence. Uh, Thoreau in some ways is not an influence in a classic sense. There's no derivation as such. It's clear biographically and textually that Gandhi learns of and reads Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience almost a year after adopting the resolution for refusal of registration and jail going. He translates and excerpts the essay in Indian opinion. And then from then, he immediately starts using the term civil disobedience. Um, as an equivalent of Satyagraha and continually cites Thoreau as its greatest expert and practitioner. And in, in some ways you can it, see why. Actually civil disobedience is closer to what Gandhi was actually doing in South Africa, from the refusal of registration to various forms of illegal border crossings to the burning of registration certificates. Satyagraha in these early years was primarily about engaging in creative forms of mass lawbreaking as a purposeful strategy of disruption. Tolstoyan non-resistance, on the other hand, in a way is much closer to the idea of mass withdrawal, or what would eventually be in the Gandhian repertoire, non-cooperation. So eventually, Tolstoy, eventually Gandhi does come back to a classical Tolstoyan strategy in non-cooperation, but that return is not straightforward, and it's, it also is not a straightforward application of Tolstoy. So Gandhi's next major encounter with Tolstoy is in London in 1909. Um, in the middle of the Transvaal campaign, Gandhi comes to London to uh, negotiate or help put forward the Indian case during the negotiations in London for the Parliamentary Act that will create the Union of South Africa. Um, and this is also the summer uh, of the pre, the important summer in London of the precursor of writing of Hind Swaraj. So Gandhi's next major encounter with Tolstoy is actually direct. In that summer, Tolstoy's letter to a Hindu, Hindu comes to Gandhi's hands. He decides to translate it into English and Gujarati, or publish it in English. And, he, and, and that process sparks a, sh a direct, short, and mutually admiring correspondence with an elderly Tolstoy. And in Hind Swaraj, um, in Hind Swaraj and especially in this letter, um, letter to a Hindu, you get the presentiment of the logic of non-cooperation, though I'll come back to when it actually comes into being. And this is from this um, 
I'm going to just quote a, a quote from the letter to a Hindu that Gandhi quotes a few times. When he writes the introduction to the letter that he publishes in Indian Opinion, he highlights this quote. So, and I think, again, it's the quote that gives the logic of non-cooperation. Quote, a commercial company enslaved a nation comprising 200 million people. Tell this to a man who is free from superstition, and he will fail to grasp what these words mean. What does it mean that 30,000 people, not athletes, but rather weak and ill-looking, have enslaved 200 millions of vigorous, clever, strong, freedom-loving people? Do not the figures make it clear that not the English, but the Indians have enslaved themselves? So here, there are two, theoret two key theoretical points that, um, again, you see worked out in Hind Swaraj. One, of course, the main, one of the main claims or major theme of Hind Swaraj is that India was not conquered by the British and it cannot, was not and cannot be held by force. And this was against the militant claim who had argued and defended armed resistance precisely as a counter, a counter force to British power. Secondly, and this is more hinted in Hind Swaraj, is the, ins the insistence to insist that Indians enslaved themselves was also to insist that they retained the power to undo and transform situations of subjection. The flip side of self-enslavement, in short, was the inherent capacity, inherent capacity for self-emancipation. The absurd contrast between a numerically tiny elite ruling over a mass of subjects exposed the ever-present possibility of reversal. This is also um, a Tolstoyan theme. Tolstoy would often say that the, the state of most governments was precisely a tiny elite ruling over a mass of subjects and not in their interests. Now, Gandhi's uh, program of non-cooperation would build on this basic logic, this kind of inverted theory of power that it implied, but it would dif differ quite substantially on how, why and how one engages in acts of withdrawal. So here I'll just go to the Second, a second moment of intense um, epiphany, or what the language Gandhi would use later, is discovery in the theory of Satyagraha. So pointing, uh, coming back to a moment that Dimi mentioned, a lot of my work really wants to foreground 1919 and 1922 um, as this moment of a major extension of the theory of Satyagraha. Um, and it was an in unusually dense moment in the convergence and theory and practice and innovation. New forms of satyagraha were tried and tested at, quote, as, and this is a quote from Gandhi, as satyagraha was being brought to play, into play on a large scale and on the political field for the first time, he notes he was, quote, ever making new discoveries. So the period of mass satyagraha, I think, is an, it's a new kind of set of questions and dilemmas. And there is, again, this sort of intense period, like the period of the invention of Satyagraha, of discovery and refinement, beginning with the Rowlett Satyagraha in 1919 and culminating, at least in one phase, with the non-cooperation movement in 1920, 1922. So it was in this period that Gandhi filled out the main branches of what he termed the tree of Satyagraha, the science of Satyagraha. The roots of the tree had been laid, Satya, truth, since the term was invented. Ahimsa, nonviolence, was added after Gandhi's return to India as the core branch, or sorry, core roots. The branches of the tree would be now delineated, each branch con connoting one of the three primary forms that Satyagraha would take, civil disobedience, non-cooperation, and constructive Satyagraha. The opportunity to test and refine Satyagraha, especially in its mass disobedience dimension, came with the, with the Rowlith Acts. These were a series of acts extending wartime emergency powers to fight sedition. The Rowlith campaign, Gandhi's first nationwide Satyagraha, inaugurated what I now think we can call an originary dilemma of Satyagraha or of Gandhian politics, namely the tendency of mass Satyagraha to spark, devolve, mutate into violence. The mass civil disobedience point part of the Rowlith campaign was um, immediately suspended in, uh, in one week. And what was troubling about the violence that it was undertaken by Gandhi's supporters and sympathizers. Gandhi's biggest critics at the time, liberals, had been warning Gandhi of precisely such an outcome. In their view, Indians were just not ready for mass politics, let alone the subtle politics of mass disobedience. So I think again here, Satyagraha, as it was inaugurated, faced this existential crisis. 
Gandhi had to prove Satyagraha could actually be nonviolent or give up on mass Satyagraha. And he faced two, two foundational questions in this period. What is Satyagraha without civil disobedience? And then a second, which I won't answer, is how you could restart mass civil disobedience without violence. The first question I'll focus on, because it's here that the strategy of non-cooperation emerges as an alternative form of satyagraha, less openly aggressive than mass civil disobedience, but a form that could, over time, scale up and pave the way towards it. Eventually, it could culminate in total rebellion and total swaraj. The way non-cooperation worked um, was progressive. There were four planks. You first give up titles, um, um, uh, imperial titles or titles and offices, ceremonial. You boycott schools and courts. The third and fourth steps get into civil disobedience. You boycott or refuse to pay revenue tax. And the final is refusal to serve an army and the police. Uh, so it's inverted in some ways. Again, Tolstoy would have begun with the refusal to serve in the army. Now here I just want to say <coughs> one point. Um, you know, so it was precisely out of the, f it was a about a specific fear of, of violence coming from dis civil disobedience uh, that Gandhi started turning slowly to developing the practical logic of non-cooperation and thinking, and as he thought through which institutions ought to be boycotted, and which, um, which, and how to do that. This is, I think, when he, again, he invents the practice in some ways, then gives it a name, non-cooperation. He even looks into Indian equivalents of that term. Then he refines the theory, describes the logic of withdrawal, the idea of um, withdrawal from a, a complicity with an unjust regime. So he returns to these Tolstoyan frameworks to give a fully worked out um, elaboration. And here I think most interestingly, he really develops the theory of power underlying this theory of non-cooperation. You know, the idea, I'll just give one quote, he says it over and over, even the most despotic government cannot stand except for the consent and collaboration of the governed. He repeats that very often. This is a core theoretical idea since uh, for, for nonviolent politics today. It's the logic of um, what Jean Sharp calls the consent theory of power, what many thinkers of nonviolence have developed with Arendt, along with Arendt and Sharp. This is nonviolent action in concert. Um, so I think, that, so again, so this is just illustrating one important moment of the kind of um, reverse logic or re recursive logic. The last point I'll say before concluding um, is that the second, um, secondly, you also see uh, a kind of, this is also when I come back to the first point about vegetarianism, you see Gandhi here also developing um, a return to constructive satyagraha. So constructive satyagraha is another alternative to civil disobedience as the main form of satyagraha. And this, in the, it's in this period that Gandhi starts theorizing spinning as a kind of um, manual labor that's universal and that could be done um, could be done as a mode of creating Swaraj. So again, he calls it a kind of epiphany. The way he gets to it is, is again, sort of practical and strategic. One of the big planks of non-cooperation is the boycott of schools. It's one of the most controversial. So many, uh, throughout this entire period, if uh, Gandhi's, uh, Gandhi's politics were clearly critical or uh, disturbing a certain um, monopoly of politics by an English educated elite. The critique of English education was the core plank of Hind Swaraj. And here too, he, the, the challenge over whether to boycott schools turned on the question of what would people be losing if people pulled themselves out of school. And they would often ask, what should these kids do <laughs> if they're boycotted? One was, one compromise solution that the Congress accepted was you could delay boycott of schools until you, or, and you produce national schools. So you produce alternatives. And then Gandhi came up again. He said the epiphany is like, but what they, what they do until that happens is spin. So spinning and Kadi becomes a kind of manual labor that's uh, for self-sufficiency. It's a universal labor that brings together rich and poor. It's a daily activity, brings together men and women, and it's meant to overcome the radical hierarchy of labor, labor that's represented by the traditional Hindu caste order. And it comes back, though, to, again, a core sort of 
thesis about self-sufficiency, and it develops over time. So those are, um, so here I think uh, I'm gonna end with some conclusions. Um, so I think the example that you get, what I'm trying to show a little bit with the, the way in which late Gandhi adapts or is for, informed by late Victorian ideology or ideas is to really think through what it would mean to move away from an influence paradigm. And in some ways I would say even strongly for a thinker like Gandhi, the right way to read Gandhi uh, is uh, that his political thinking was experimental. The theory is worked out through practical engagement in politics. I think the other side of it is that um, part of the reason that, you know, it, the in, an intellectual biography, part of the reason I think the other reluctance is on the flip side, there's often a kind of presumption that Gandhi had a worked out idea of Satyagraha in his mind, or at least worked out in South Africa, that just gets uh, applied uh, on a mass scale in India and then to social questions. And it's just a change of application. And so there's very little um, uh, scholarly work on how the idea, the theory and practice of Satyagraha have changed over time. Again, you often use justifications that Gandhi would give in the 1940s to a practice in the tribe. So you just have this mix of, there's no temporality to Gandhi. Um, so I think in some ways, thinking of experiment forces you to think in some ways that there is a temporality, even if there are these recur recursive moments. I think the other is, there is a, a you know, Gandhi called himself a practical politician, a gardener, a cultivator, not an idealist. And I think people recognize that there is some innovation in Gandhi as, um, as someone who was adept at putting ideas into practice. But I really think that's slightly the wrong way around. I think, again, we should be thinking of it not as putting ideas into practice, but testing or developing through practice ideas, which is a very different model than application. Again, the sense that politics is a scene of constant experimentation, where he's making ever new discoveries, First half of his life, you would call them epiphanies, later you would call them discoveries. Um, and again, that, it, that this is how you can trace these um, moments of innovation and deepening. Uh, and one thing he does, I think, as a wellspring, in the early years, he does return to certain texts, the Kingdom of God is within you, Thoreau, also the Gita. And in later years, when he doesn't have as much time to read, you can see him returning to some of these four texts. There, and it's a different kind of reading in that way. Now, one main objection, I think, to this kind of tracing is I think there is also a school of thought that would say, you know, the more you talk about Gandhi as a tinkerer, they would say Gandhi is really a much more haphazard and inconsistent uh, thinker than I'm implying. And maybe there, there's a lot of maybe too much normative investment in thinker and originality working out here. I, I am less um, committed to the idea of originality as a great moral phenomenon, but I am interested in um, the idea that Gandhi uh, is, um, his ideas, there is consistency to them. They still can be internally contradictory, but there is consistency. They, they often emerge, as I try to show, through polemic, through strategy. He's often testing them. Some ideas in his way up. But I think there is a coherence and consistency in theorization. And actually, one key piece of evidence is how careful and interesting he is in terminology. So he, he invents terms and he sticks with it. Satyagraha, so non cooperation, he looked for an alternative word, which was asayakar or non cooperation. He didn't pick up ahimsa when he starts using the term, he sticks to it and develops it. The tree of Satyagraha stays consistent. Those are the three forms. He never adds another change. So I think. There is um, coherence and consistency. There may be long-standing internal uh, paradoxes or contradictions. So I'll just end on coming back to the innovation from Tolstoy. I think in some deep way, we can always think that what, what Gandhi, how Gandhi differs from Thoreau, Tolstoy, or that particular kind of um, <coughs> theorization of individuality and moral integrity is his attempt to combine that with mass politics. And that's, in a way, the deepest innovation in Gandhi, and it's also the one that's most fraught. It never is entirely solved, but it's one that he constantly faces, and it's one that he never gives up on. And I think the innovations come out of that um, continuous struggle. Thank you.
have time for um, questions and discussion. So, um, do you um, we have a microphone? Thank you so much for that. I'm, I want to ask you about a figure you didn't mention. And it's, I want to warn you, it's a hobby horsical question. Um, I just sent out page probes on an essay last month that I wish I had your lecture um, to, to, at, at hand to, to uh, save me from probably a lot of errors. But the figure is Shelley. Um, and um, uh, Shelley was, I mean, Lila talks about Gandhi and Shelley. She's she vegetarianism. The other side of Shelley's vegetarianism, of course, he was one of the first theorists of revolutionary nonviolence, certainly in, in English. Um, and he confronted in Peter, the Peterloo Massacre, he, he was confronting a, a scene of you know, police brutality of the sort that we got used to, all too used to in the 200 years since then. And he worked out a whole plan about how to do that. You have to resist, you can't fight back. That's, that's August of 1890. Before that, he had written Prometheus on Bound, which really lays the whole thing out in poetic form. So when Gandhi got to London and was hanging around Henry Salt, which is part of the vegetarian connection, which Lee yes. talks about and which you talked about, I mean, Henry Salt had just written three books on Shelley. In this period, he wrote three books on Shelley. He had just published one the year before Gandhi got there. Yeah. And Henry Salt understands this connection between Shelley's vegetarianism yes. and his pursuit of revolutionary nonviolence. And he lays it out pretty carefully. He's a pretty good reader of Shelley because he's figuring a lot of it out from Prometheus Unbound without this tract called The Philosophical View of Reform, where Shelley lays out this whole plan of the psychology of passive resistance against cops and, and soldiers. Um, but fragments of that text are around, and Salt's got them, and he's sort of quoting them. So it seems impossible to me that close as he was to Salt, all in as he was on the question of vegetarianism, and with Salt's more expansive view of Shelley, who was, after all, a big figure in Victorian chartism, right? That works are being, you know, Shelley's not an unknown figure. He was, it, Working class from reading him through pirated editions. But I'm not blaming you for this because Gandhi doesn't take him up, or he doesn't seem to, he doesn't register, he's not one of the people he mentions. Now, late in life, he'll, he'll say, You are many, there are few. He'll quote the Master of Anarchy, which is from exactly that same moment. But there's something really strange about somebody who could spend this much time with salt, kind of buy in on the vegetarian side but not on the other side of the bloodthirstiness, right? The, the warlikeness. Do you have an explanation? Is it about, is it about Shelley's atheism? That's what I was, that's no, what I was thinking. I, I, it's, a, it's a good point. I have to, I, I, you know, Gandhi is, he reads pretty selectively. And I think uh, the interesting, you know, even so, Salt is someone he reads. Uh, he, and talks to him, right? He talks to him, but it's not entirely clear that they're very close. He goes to the meetings. Salt is kind of a figurehead, and not in, he's sort of like someone he admires. And he reads a lot of Salt, and, and they have a correspondence later where Salt writes to him and says, "Do you remember me? <laughs> you know, this night we must have met." But they didn't have a direct correspondence except for much later. And 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 there, it's also the case that you know the other famous book that Salt writes. Uh, and he's, I mean, Salt is a much more important figure, more generally for us, I would say, because he also writes a popular biography of Thoreau. Yeah. And, he, and he edits Thoreau's writings. And there's also a good, a good, I think, um, argument to be made that it's through Salt and the Tolstoyan circle that starts distributing civil disobedience. That that essay starts to have the history of Dutch. Because until then, Thoreau is known as the writer of Walden. The Nature Writer and other essays, but not civil disobedience. So there's also something. So I have to look through it. It's a great question. It, I think, part, to my mind, part of Gandhi's reading is connected to these circles, and they're dominated by Tolstoy's. And the presses are Tolstoy. So I do think, like, what he reads of Thoreau, what he reads of Plato, are all little pamphlets published by a Tolstoy. 
months. Mm -hmm. And I had to check if they published Shelley. And I, I tried to figure that out. And yeah. I find it out. I'll see if I can find it because that would be that would be the that would be the set. Those are the people he is like. You know, when he goes to London and repeat trips, he'll buy everything that the Tolstoy and Press is producing and put them in the ashram. And so I do think there's something about what they're collectively reading. And again, like in, in Hinsraj, some of the other groups that he's interested in are more religious. So the ethical societies, um, they're, that, and it's in those groups he reads Carpenter in this group in London as he's writing Hinsraj. Yeah. So, yeah, but it's, it's 1906, right? Yeah. 1909. So he's reading, he's read Carpenter, he rereads it in this circle, and then it suddenly sparks a new way of thinking about it. But it's a great question because obviously there are other books that are circulating uh, labor texts. You know, this Sherard text, The White Slaves of England, is he's the grandson of Wordsworth. So he's a direct so there so that he is picking up on some of that, but I do think um, I, I do think the you know the main the other the other political stuff he's interested in is some of the labor activism and of course the suffrage. So he's very interested in them, he's meeting them, going to the meetings. But in terms of his own world of reading, I, you're probably right that they are um, more, um, they're variations of rationalist Christianity, I would say. And some, and actually that's that's the difference between him and the theosophists. He's much more interested in the practical ethical, practical ethics of <laughs> people. So that, that's where I would have to check to see. But I, I, I have not found that he's <laughs> He's, he does read some Shelley in jail, but it's the poetry. But it's the best I can. Yeah, so I have to, but I'll keep my eye out and see. We'll, we'll work on this good point. <laughs> but yes, the important thing is Thoreau, Shelley, they all come up as uh, people, you know, the book of Howard Williams lists, you know, uh, all of the vegetarians from Prometheus <laughs> to Schopenhauer. <laughs> so uh, Shelley and Thoreau are in there. Thoreau, you know, they all write about it. Thoreau wasn't a mentioning, but he wrote about it and said it was a good idea. <laughs> There's a question over there, a question here. And another one here. So maybe start with that slide for work. Thanks for this great talk. I just have a quick question. Um, is there a difference in the way that Gandhi theorizes habituation to action when it's kind of explicitly tethered to what we think of as politics? So um, in the example of civil, di civil disobedience or non-cooperation versus something like, you mentioned briefly but didn't kind of draw it out, like cooperative living arrangements. So like, does he see these as related? Are they the same kind of thing? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, in the in in the um, intimate sense, they're the same because I think what he means of uh, you know it's finding a individual practice, uh, and you can see that those can be scaled up in a, in specific ways. I think the way to think of it. I mean, one of the things he does again, I, I think, is an assimilative reader. So he you know thinks that Tolstoy's no, he, he, you know, he thinks all of these are, the, the law of love is equivalent to an understanding of self-mastery, or say the first step of vegetarianism is about constraint. He thinks this principle of sort of self-constraint, uh, fasting, self esteem these are common to all religions, they all have moments of it, because they think there's something important about restraining self. He thinks the Hindu tradition, the Indian tradition may have been the most interested in Maybe more devoted to it on a general principle level. So, so I think a lot of what he takes to be the idea of how you translate either a constructive or in disobedience, it, and it's more important maybe a constructive program of a, uh, of a daily practice. So whether that's spinning, whether it's cleaning, a certain kind of um, silence, all of these are uh, practices of self-constraint that do train, they have immediate effects of transforming some system of domination, uh, equality of some kind, um, and I, but he also thinks they are training in mass disobedience and those experiments. I think the key difference, he'll say, is destructive, said the Agraha, mass disobedience, uh, mass civil disobedience, some forms of non-cooperation, Non-cooperation is a more complicated because some parts of it are permanent. It's a constructive program and some parts of non-cooperation are permanent. You just do them as you're reconstructing an alternative society, alternative relationships. But 
But the moments of sort of civil disobedience or this kind of strategy of collective breaking of laws or withdrawing consent, I think he thinks those are um, moments of globalization that can't be permanent. There are too much problem of collective power is a psychological problem of a kind of temptation towards mastery. And that would come into deep conflict with the everyday practices of constraint. So there are moments when you have to do that. I mean, he doesn't, again, that's why he doesn't believe in permanent revolution. He doesn't believe in cascading revolution. He thinks you have these moments where there is a collective upsurge, but you do have to end. Like campaigns end, there are particular reasons. And that's one of one of many of the confusions about the end of non-cooperation, which ends, um, you know, again, he, call, he calls off non-cooperation and those, and I think a Marxist theory of collective power, cascading revolution leading to a takeover of power, they're always very stunned by when and why not he wants to stop. And I think part of the thinks of these is iterative mobilizations towards Raj, but the real work is always going to be the sustaining of that construct. Thank you. I learned so much from that. Um, I wanted to go back to the, the part that you said at the end about how Gandhi is um, like sort of accused of or labeled a tinkerer, and then there's something like haphazard. And it made me think, um, like if you're looking for a, a concept to capture what that is, there's this um, the responsiveness to a moment, to the sort of dynamic flux of events. In ancient Greek, kairos yeah. is that yes. idea, right? To, that what in, in, so in Plato, the, the political art, the art of politics, is to grasp the right moment. Yes. And so, was, and, and, the, and you know, in that dialogue, leaving or textile kind of work yeah, yeah, is yeah. is present, and it's a topos in, in Greek thought. So, saying like to rest him. To, to rest him from the kind of the Platonism that seems to be yeah. dominating the, yes. the reading of well, Platonism, not not Plato, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is this like all these binaries, like he's either a theorist or he's a, an actor, and there's something um, actually deeply important about his his responsiveness, his flexibility that is actually extremely difficult to yes. to practice. Yeah, I think that's right. And again, I think um, Nehru also called, you know, again, the skill of Gandhi would say is that he, he recognized the moment. Yeah, yeah. He could, there's something he could capture. The moment he could come up, he could come up with the songs of Nehru as the kind of symbolic, some way you come up with these imaginative things that can link these ideas. I think that's true. I think, um, so yeah, so I think in some, I, I think I have to think about it because I think there is a school of thought that will say there is a kind of flexibility yeah. that ends up being Machiavellian, you know, right. that ends up being that not being, that's again gets back to the idea of um, Gandhi being, um, you know, uh, he can say everything so yeah, or he determines it, and there's something um, untrustworthy. And I, I think I want to. I think you're right that he is reacting to moments. I think there's something really important about that. And I actually, I, I think it's more important. I think to see he comes up with again, he calls in the fifties. He's like he comes up with a project. He's like, I think I've got an answer, and then he pr tries it out. And most of the time, they're interesting, and they kind of he keeps going with them. So I think the interesting thing to me is the flexibility, but then he gives it a form. You know, it's not yeah. it's not just pure flexibility. He kind of is. He's stabilizing it in a concept. Yeah. So I do think that's why Satyagraha is a thing with definite concepts and forms. And yeah. No, but how do you, what concept do you use to use? To you describe. Want, yeah. So not just to reconstruct the kingdom, but what do you, I'm not saying you yeah. use the yeah. but there is a, there's something that. Yes, I, yes, I'll have to think about it because I do think that the traditional language is judgment. Right. Which I think is a, there's something that is um, not flexible in that term. So I think you're right. I have to, um, I'll have to think about it. But I, I do think the way, what I think is interesting is that he, he is trying to find these, um, he is responding instinctively, but again, <coughs> trying to, uh, the most innovative thing to me in the end though is the response takes a particular kind of practice. So he comes up with an actual campaign 
I think, and for our language today, I think what's missing in a lot of discussions about nonviolence and mass protests is um, Gandhi and King, nonviolent protest was a specific form. It wasn't just demonstrations, you know, it wasn't just getting, definitely not just a bunch of people getting together, because it's more, it's not about numbers, ultimately. And it has to have this kind of staging, and it has to have a kind of form, you know, the kind, a set of practice that, um, even if someone doesn't believe the creed of nonviolence, if they follow the rules, they are practicing something. You know, that's the idea of having, and I didn't talk about that at all in this, because I still just want to get it, some of the um, the originating kind of justifications and the link, but I think that that's something that is very distinctively obvious. When you take it to the next level, you have to um, give it a form. It can't, can't be loose. It has to have rules and vows that you follow with this. So I, I have to just kind of back to the kind of question, but provoked by um, things that you said and sort of making sense of stuff that I noticed in Gandhi, but I don't you know what you made it clear to me. So I want to sort of imagine this as a, a think about Gandhi's transformation in terms of a political economy story. And let me sort of spin this out. So I have some disagreements with, with um, Jim's uh, claim for the originality of Shelley. I mean, it strikes me that in the 18th century, there's a kind of series of movements which are creating political economy of revolutionary transformation, nonviolent revolutionary transformation, which is explicitly theorized, turning around consumption. And the idea is that the, the empire, they see sort of empire, British empire, particular empires in general, as empires of production, that the idea is to use the power of consumption uh, to resist in a variety of ways. Um, this happens in North America in the 1760s and 1770s. It's absolutely theorized by Henry Flood, who calls it uh, a revolutionary transformation without violence in a series of pamphlets uh, in Ireland in the 1780s. Um, and there's a movement of, and a lot of these people begin thinking about this, and, and your theory of vegetarianism yeah. is a theory of consumption, right? I mean, it's a theory of consumption to have resistance. And it's, well, no, I mean, it's a theory of consumption. And what's quite interesting is both Flood and Franklin begin to imagine vegetarianism as a form of consumption, of resistance of consumption uh, in, a, in a variety of ways. Um, and it strikes me that your sort of South African moment is a moment which is focused initially on sort of consumption. But what strikes me as sort of really interesting about your 1920s moment is that Gandhi shifts to a theory of production where spinning is at the heart of it, but it's individual production as opposed to collective production because it's about moral, and that creates individual moral transformation. I mean, that, that is, so, so I mean, I, I guess what I'm wondering is whether you could tell some sort of, oh, this, that strikes me as incredibly transformative because that allows, allows it to sort of marry moral transformation to mass movement, which, you know, a theory of consumption doesn't matter. A theory of consumption, in a sense, says, you know, we just need to take the power that we already have. Um, right. Well, I mean, I think um, the thing about some of the, you know, the radical vegetarian movements, and if you really link them to self-sufficiency, then, you know, they're, they are about consumption, they're also withdrawing from the system. So, they're not to be some other commodity, they're just refusing. Oh, absolutely. And, and, yeah, so I think, and I, so I, but I think, but I actually I think, um, you know, obviously in this period when Gandhi's switching, you know, rethink, actually thinking of spinning for the first time, because he's playing around, weaving, you know, he literally doesn't know, he, he talks about hand loops in, um, in his rush, he hasn't actually come up with Kavi. I think though it's, it's slightly different, it is mass, because it's, it's clearly the idea is you're producing an all, it is production, and, and it is an alternative symbolic consumption to an alternative consumption, but it is a mass scale, and, that, and that's again a kind of contradiction. I mean, you know, you are doing it, you know, the ideal model, I mean, most of the Kavi question as it develops in the 20s and 30s is about the All India Spinning Association and its mass coordination of cooperative industry. So you're always scaling up and he events 
you know, whether he it's inconsistent or he gets he gets drawn into having to scale up something that he thought could be centered at the village level um, to do a kind of that's Gandhi and economics is ultimately trying to. But I also think there is a kind of um, I think Gandhi is also very interesting. Collect like it's kind of the perfect model of Gandhi and collectivities because it's radically isolated individuals that are in the act of spinning are radically turning inward, but their acts are staged collectively. And so it is a mess. It's just a, a different kind of mess. So I have to I have to think about it because I actually do think um, you know when you talk when Gandhi is talking about the division of labor, part of what they're talking about is undoing that division between consumption and production, obviously. I mean the idea is to localize it and bring those two together and to stop them being separate. The other thing that happens in this period, I think, is he, you know, is the question of obviously the Congress Party or the Indian Nationalist case for uh, they they take on money obviously because it's a part of the story of deindustrialization. So um, yeah, I I I would we'll have to come back to the if there is a an economic story in South Africa there is because it's about traders you know these are South you know but I also think that. Um, you know, I do think that there's, in a way, the real shift that's happening in the 20s, I think, not you know, mass politics, it's also that I think Gandhi has, it is the moment when you also really are turning inward in the sense of what kind of Swaraj are we producing? And it becomes a question of, of the kind of psychology power. And I do think that, that that's, um, there's something very deep, and I have to kind of think through it, is, Again, yeah, we tend to think of massness as important for non-cooperation. Of course, the, the um, empirical literature and the social scientific literature has, you know, in a way, proven that it's really about mass power overturning regimes. And I think, in some ways, that work obviously it's proven. That's the empirical evidence. I think is right. A certain level of participation can undermine the legitimacy of any regime, however authoritarian. But I think what Gandhi gets at is this other, much more complicated question of. Why mass nonviolent movements, mass movements in democracies, it's much more unclear when they work and when they don't. And I think part of it is that you are dealing with um, a different. You're, you're dealing with competing powers, you know, competing mobilizations, which do have more of a threat of po a direct power. So I think that that's what's true. That's I think what really is the center of Gandhi's question of massness and trying to individuate it. <laughs> In the twenties, <laughs> yeah, but I'll have to think about the translation of that. You may have just answered my question, but I'll I'll, I'll say it anyway. But um, I also want to start with an observation. You said that you you weren't a historian of science, and that part of what you're doing might you know have a resonance with uh, Allison's book. And I just wanted to say I I very much. Uh, I guess took your talk that way, and it reminded me of, you know, the move in history science away from the kind of histories that really looked at, you know, the great minds and the ideas they had, but that, you know, now you look at what happens uh, in history science very much uh, as what people are doing, the practices they have, and the yeah. that they're in, and that kind of, for you, yeah, it's hard to separate thinker and actor, and I think you see the same uh, in the history of science. Now, and, I, and so I guess this kind of disciplinary observation made me think about, I guess, your discipline, and, um, and and I think maybe some of your response just now helped me understand what maybe you were hoping to offer uh, your discipline, but you mentioned the uh, the way in which Gandhi's approached, and that, you know, people tend to look at him as either thinker or an actor, but is that, um, and I'm not a political, I mean, I actually do history of science, but I'm not in um, political theory, but is that, I guess this may be your, your methodological approach, something that you think maybe needs to be used more in political theory, you know, maybe we should read all of Rousseau instead of just a social contract or something. Um, but I don't know, I guess, and then also just, I thought of that also because of, I think your move, you know, I guess had a lot, spoke a lot to someone who does something in a different field. But. Yeah. Um, yes, in some way, I mean, I think, uh, I think there is a kind of, in political philosophy, there's sometimes a, a mistaken debate <laughs> I think about if you give someone, if you give a deep kind of contextual reading of the origins of an idea, some people think that's deeply deflationary, that it's somehow 
reducing it to this. But I, you know, that was a kind of old debate between the Straussians and sort of Cambridge school historians. And you take some, you take some thinkers and reduce, you're reducing them to their historical context. But I, I guess my own view is in some ways to show originality or innovations, precisely you have to kind of give a sense of the alternative ideas of the time. And I think for Gandhi in particular, one sentence, I, I do think it matters. Like in, in a way, I think to show Gandhi's innovation, if you compare him to a thinker far away, like say Hobbes, or something like that, then you, you're getting very stark contrast, two different ways of understanding the social order, et cetera. And it's deeply interesting. But I also think if you want to get at what Gandhi, what might be like the texturally innovative, then you have to, to me, it's important to compare him to this close, closest kin in some ways, and in that sense, uh, Tolstoy, Thoreau, other thinkers of past, you know, you're getting, to me, a different kind of texture of what is happening there. I think, to me, so in general, I am of the view that, yes, you should read more than one text, <laughs> and you should, I, mean, I think it's less about reading the text than um, understanding the question they're trying to answer. You know, that's also a very classic political theory question, I think that, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important move still to be said about, you know, what is, what, you know, there's a, we, when we reconstruct Satyagraha, we often assume that we know what the answer is. We think he's looking for a world without violence, for example. But if you look at, say, these three moments that I've talked about, you know, in South Africa, Satyagraha emerges as an alternative form of politics. There's no critique of violence because he just thinks we're going to produce this alternative form of a uh, new way of doing politics. He's very excited about it. It has this religious idea and it has this ethical core and its moral integrity. And he thinks um, you can move away from, if, you just, if we show this works, this will have a universal application to oppress people. So then the Insuraj is confronted with uh, you know, people who defend assassination and armed resistance. Then he has develops again, reaches into Tolstoy and others for a genuine critique of violence. So now he has to show that Satyagraha is more effective than violence. So it's not just an alternative, it's actually a better practical alternative. He has to actually show why violence and that was societies produced through violence or movements that produce violence through uh, you know regimes that are built on violence will undo themselves. So and then the next moment again in mass. Satyagraha, then you have this other dilemma. What if Satyagraha produces violence internal? So there's another kind of nonviolence in practice that has to mitigate and self-correct. So uh, to me, it's um, so I think I think those. So if there's a, I guess my work, I would say I would say yes. The two lessons I would hope is one that traditional thinkers in the canon we should reconstruct really have a preciseness of the questions they're trying to answer because that gives a better sense of who, are the, who we're learning from and whether those questions are still with us. The answers only make sense if the questions still make sense to us. And I think the other is, as we're trying to read new figures, and especially actors, there are a lot of actors who are political theorists, and I think especially now expanding the anti-colonial canon, I think that it really it is important to kind of I think in a, I, this is not the only way, but I think I, it's to open up a question about how we judge what is um, theoretical in active. And I think in Gandhi, you know, I can tell you this, but I have to give you the evidence in case. There are failed experiments in Gandhi, you know, there are ideas that don't go anywhere. And I think there are, he is strategizing, so he'll come up with a polemic, and you do have to see over time if it builds into a theory or it just stays as a polemic. So that's kind of a work of reading and interpretation and not, but I think it's useful for people, you know, I know people are trying to read people like, uh, especially in an era of leaders, you know, Nehru or Nkrumah or these, uh, they are, they're intellectuals in politics and they, their ideas change very quickly <laughs> and the question, and it's not, and, and in a way, you know, uh, to, it's the equivalent in, in Nehru would be something like if you, if you cite Marx in one year and then 20 years later you cite Marx, it's a very different use of Marx. And that's sort of what I think would be interesting and exciting to get a sense of is how people use and cite as they develop. Um, Karuna, thanks for that. And um, two terms I kept coming up during the talk were influence and experiment. Yes. And as a failed musician, I was translating those as creative appropriation and improvisation. I think you'd go along with creative appropriation, but I'm not sure about 
in normalization. So that's the question. That's a good question, and it comes back to a bit of DNAs, and I have to think about it because I have often used improvisation, but I don't. Yeah, you're right. I don't know if that's the right. I mean, again, there is the part that I did not um, think through, and I have to. Is also the language of experiment is also, um, you know, the title of Gandhi's autobiography is "Experiment with Truth." The the in, the Sanskrit origin terms, right? I think that those are those practices. So there is, I mean, there's experiment in a experiments on the self, close to ideas of practice that are part of various Hindu thinking. So there is another. Um, there is, I think, there's a reason why he seeks to the term experiment because it has this other genealogy. But I have, to, and, and so it's not. I think that part of experiment is really much more about the idea that, yeah, I, I think experiment is much more about the relationship between self and practice. A practice is one in which a um, work on the self is involved. But I, I think in the idea of reacting to a moment and the idea of innovation, I sometimes do think, I have to think, I sometimes use improvisation. But what do you take to be the big difference between creative appropriation and improvisation? Oh, well, one is about influence. Ah, okay. Okay, got it. Okay. Yes, that's helpful. So I think he, I think he tends to in, improvise in practice, and then the ideas have some creative information. So thank you, that helps me. I think one, one last question. Um, so. Thank you. Thank um, you. I'm pretty loud. This is a recording. Uh, Karna, I wanted to uh, thank you a bit, um, also to return to the left critique of Gandhi around calling off non-cooperation, right? And I think in the best version of that, the, the critique runs something on the order of that Gandhi sacrificed the goal for the sake of the purity of the movement. Right? And, and he says as much about maybe people aren't ready to be satyagrahis. And you said a great deal about theory and practice in your talk, and much of it is, is quite compelling about him rethinking the relationship of the two as the political objectives change from South Africa to India. And I guess I wanted to ask one sort of directly about the moment that you're working on, the influence of Fabianism, right? Uh, you mentioned Carpenter. Clearly in the lead up to the, run, or to the writing of Hind Swaraj, there's a great deal of fragmentation of liberalism in Britain, right? You have the Liberal Party literally breaking apart and the rise of the independent Labour Party and of Labour. So the question of, the, uh, of Fabianism and its remit, right, and thinking about, they're deeply invested in thinking about a different way of getting to socialism, right? Um, and then related to that, the, you know, you've done, you brought up multiple resonances of Satyagraha, but in thinking about his the political objective of Swaraj, it seems to me that that's the slipperier term. Um, could you say something about how you understand the political contours and elements of Swaraj for him? Yes. Um, that's a very long answer, but I'm going to do short, and I mean, I'll do the shorter version, which is I do think that is what's at stake in, you know, I, Gandhi calls out non-cooperation because of the violence at Shari Chara, uh, where policemen are, you know, there's a demonstration, a non-cooperation demonstration that is fired upon, it is larger in numbers, it, um, you know, the demonstrators, volunteers, chase the policemen into the Thana and burn the Thana. So that's what happens at Chari Chara and Gandhi uh, is a radical moment of reckoning because he calls up Rao and he sees it, he tries again civil disobedience and this is another break. Now I think um, the, so I, so I would say that it's also as a moment where Gandhi realizes through this that he says it all the way through from Hindu Swaraj onward that Swaraj as self-mastery, which is an individual, sense is also has a kind of collective version, which is partially about unity, which is a kind of 
this is where Tolstoy, I said Tolstoy's criticism of Gandhi, when he said privately, is you know, very admiring, but he's still an Indian nationalist. And it's because Gandhi is so interested in unity in some point. So there is some playing around with collectives. But um, Gandhi realizes, I think, in, in, in uh, initially for Rowlett and Mass at the Agrava, his first um, sort of um, travels through India, he still thinks that what people need to learn is to overcome their fear of authority and overcome their fear. And he saw the elites as, as people who were feared telling the truth. So they tended to dissimulate and, um, and then secretly support violence. And so he thought the whole point of Satyagraha in the beginning is to teach ordinary people to overcome their fear of authority, British power, and see that they have power in themselves. So that's one version of what Satyagraha is supposed to do. That's why it's supposed to be mass, because everyone has to do it for themselves. No one can turn you, you can't, rec you, no one else can uh, uh, do anything for you to recognize your agency. So you have to do it. That's self emancipation. So I do think. He believes in self-emancipation, self-enslavement, self-emancipation. Everyone's capable of doing it. It takes a kind of attitudinal shift. There's some action. I think the problem with collective, um, what happens at Chari Chara is he realizes that in that instance, if you were talking in terms of numbers, the problem was, and he saw it all the way through, and he said it was a straw that breaks the camel back, is at the individual level, it's about power retaining oneself. But if you do it with others together, it's not just overcoming slavery, but you're instantly reveling in another kind of mastery. And it's really about, I think it's a very powerful idea that the examples he gives is precisely, he says, what is, what is dignified or courageous if a mass of people, in this case, attack a single policeman? He said, on the one hand, it seems like what Swaraj is implying, but he also says, that isn't an act of courage. Courage is standing against the crowd. So, and, and that's sacrificial, and that's dramatizing courage and sacrifice. The other is reveling in mastery. And I think there was a genuine worry that, you know, there's a certain kind of um, satyagraha against a regime that is about stoic, you know, against the regime that's, you know, the solid satyagraha, against the police unit. But he did say the problem, so the Swaraj problem is that, and he said it very specifically, it's Hindus who are feeling this mastery, because it's numbers. And so I think there's something really powerful that isn't, hasn't been tracked about the difference between a kind of psych, moral psychology of majoritarianism that Gandhi's very sensitive to. It comes from Thoreau and others that um, numbers, mass democracy in that sense is just a psychology of might, another form of might is right. So I think here that that's really at stake, and he sort of. So I, I think it's um, that's what really becomes the purpose of rethinking Swaraj post um, Charitra is the problem of uh, mastery and majoritarianism, and he says it quite seriously. I mean, very straightforward. He said the problem we see is we are seeing ourselves as powerful, and in that power we attack those who are clearly weaker to demonstrate the power. So minorities are the first targets. Cooperators <laughs> are the targets, and he says that that's that's is not a model of Swaraj. If we understand Swaraj as kind of, of democracy, I think that is to me still um, to me. I think that is still a compelling reconstruction that is it's there in the language, but it's not really recognized by many people except Tagore. Like Tagore is the only one who writes in and says, you know, congratulates him on. Well, thanks for the